I am a master gardener. Um, and I've been so for 10 years. And as you can see, I have a very background. There's a lot of interesting things to do in master gardening. But here we're today, we're going to talk about garden tools, garden hand tools specifically. And I love questions. If you have questions, I'm going to ask that you put them either into the chat or there are some natural breaks in this presentation at the ends of various topics. If you could hold on to the question till that point, I'd be happy to answer it as best I can. So welcome and thank you for attending and let's learn a few things about garden hand tools. So what do you, can you expect from today? Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about why learn about garden hand tools. Well, you've invested money into your garden hand tools and you wanna take care of that investment. And so we'll talk about ways of doing that. Using the right tool makes the work easier and safer for you uh, so that you can reduce your aches and pains and that you do less damage or no damage to the plants. And, and lastly, frankly, tools are kind of cool. And there's a whole variety of different tools out there we, I hope to introduce you to. So we're gonna talk today about the types and uses of tools. We're gonna talk about adaptive tools. So tools that you can use if you do have some aches and pains in your hands and your backs, things along that line so that you can still continue your love of gardening um, even with those uh, those pains. We're going to talk about how to purchase a tool. So what is what are the things to look for when you're buying a tool? We're going to talk about how to maintain a tool. And then all throughout this presentation, we're going to talk about garden tool safety. So whenever you see this yellow yield sign, it means we're going to talk about how you can be safe in the garden using your garden hand tools. And then lastly, this is a hand tool discussion. We won't be discussing anything about any sort of power tools. So as mentioned, I am a master gardener. Master gardeners are volunteers that are selected and trained by the University of California to share research-based gardening information with the general public. And as such, we don't make recommendations on any sort of products or services. So you're gonna see a lot of tools today. You're gonna to see a lot of brands you're familiar with and maybe some you're not familiar with. Those are just examples and not to be considered a recommendation by Master Gardeners or the University of California. So this is a slide you may wanna grab a photo of. It'll also be at the end of the presentation, but we do more than talk about just tools, just tools, I love tools. Um, we are there to help you with your garden issues you may be having. If you have a pest in the garden or your tomatoes aren't growing or you want to remove your lawn, you know, we have a hotline number that you can call us to, to get some gardening advice. You can also send us an email. Uh, we do have a specific website for garden tool care, and that is listed there. There's a lot more information on that site. And if you want to keep up with what's going on with Master Gardeners, we do have a monthly newsletter, which you can sign up for on our uh, website. And then you can follow us on the various social media platforms. So some things to know about garden tools. Let's talk about some best practices before we get into the meat of the topic. Inspect your tools before you start using them. Make sure they're in good operating condition, that they move the way that they're supposed to, that they're not rusty, that they're sanitized, and that they look like they're, they will, they're solid and will do the job. Know where your tools are located. It's always a good idea to put your name on your tools like that or to put a ribbon on them so that you can identify your tools if they get laid down in the garden somewhere. We've all had the experience, we've put down our pruners and we can't find them. So putting a ribbon or a bandana on it will help in catching your eye to identify where you put your tool down. Also, if you garden in groups at a community center, you know, it helps identify your tools from everybody else. Keep your tools in good condition. And we'll talk about this at the end of the presentation. Make sure you clean your tools when you're finished and always sanitize your tools with an alcohol wipe between plants so that you're not transmitting a disease from one plant to another plant. Use the right tool for the task and always safety, safety first. So let's learn about a variety of different tool types. 
But first, before we get into the tools, make sure we you are protected. When you go out in the garden, think about what you're going to be doing out the garden and gather those tools to take with you. Make sure that you have gloves to protect your hands, that you have closed-toed shoes, that if you are working with a chemical or if you're looking up and pruning, you have some eye goggles on to protect your eyes from the chemical or any falling debris from the tree or plant above you you're working on. A hat is always good to keep uh, yourself protected from the sun and sunscreen. Make sure you stay hydrated. You'd be amazed how much water you, you uh, emit while you are in the garden. And then always clean and sanitize your tools for the safety of the plants and for the safety of yourself. So take care of yourself first because in the U.S., 400,000 people a year are injured using garden tools. And the, the uh, biggest risk to people where they could have the most severe injuries are being cut by a tool, falling in the garden, or being struck by something in the garden, be it a garden tool or a branch that you didn't see. The most common types of injuries have to do with strains and sprains in the lower back, your wrist, your shoulders, and your neck. You know, just, just overworking your muscles. In, in while you're in the garden. So make sure you take care of yourself when you're in the garden. So one of the things that you're most commonly gonna do when you're in the garden is to cut something. You're gonna prune something or cut it back. And there are three different types of cutting devices to be aware of. The first uh, is a hand pruner. You're all probably very familiar with this device. Hand pruners are great for cutting devices up to three quarters of an inch. If you go above three quarters of an inch in the thickness of the material, then you're likely, it'll be very hard to cut, but you could also damage your pruner by putting nicks in the blade, which is right here, or getting it out of alignment, which means a gap between the blade and the hook. If you see light when you close your blade like that, that means your blade is, your pruners are out of alignment and you'll have to adjust them. The next, so if you have to cut anything bigger than three quarters of an inch, step up, go to a lopper. A lopper is a pruner with long handles. It gives you a bit more leverage and the blade is larger. So you can cut plant material up to an inch and a half with a lopper. If you still have something bigger than that to cut, get a pruning saw. This is a pruning saw. This, this device is, it cuts through plant material like a hot knife through butter. It makes it so smooth and very effective for pruning larger type items. Now, if you need to go above maybe four inches, five inches, depends on the pruner saw come in different blade lengths. So it depends on the length of blade you have. You may need to step up to a power device like a chainsaw, but use the right tool for what it is that you're going to be cutting. And whatever you do, please do not touch the blade. It's sharp. So just be aware where the blade is. Be aware where your fingers are. If you're holding a branch and you're cutting, make sure that you angle that pruner away from your hand. There are different types of cutting blades, and they have different roles in the garden. The one you're most familiar with, the one I just showed, is the bypass pruner. And it's called a bypass because this blade bypasses this hook like this. The cutting surface of this blade is here on the outside, not on the inside, but you're cutting actually here on the outside. That's where the bevel is. And if you look at the graphic below, you'll see that the, um, this part here, this is called, this is the blade, and this is the hook, and this is the, the plant material. The part here on the left is what you want to keep, and the part you want to discard is on the right. And so when it, you're cutting, you're actually just crushing the part of the plant you want to discard. The plant material that you want to keep is remaining intact. These type of pruners are great for live plant material. The next one you may be familiar with is an anvil pruner. So an anvil pruner is, looks like this. And what it has is an anvil here, and then it has a blade that goes right into the middle of the anvil and it actually cuts on both sides of this blade. And you'll see that in this graphic that's on the bottom right, is you have your blade coming here, hitting the anvil, and it's crushing the plant material side that you want to keep, and then the discard side. Anvil blades are best for using on dry plant material because of this 
feature that it has. Now, it doesn't mean that if this is the only one you have that you can't use it on live plant material. Of course you can. You just know the consequences of is that you're going to have a little bit of a crushing of your plant when you use this on live plant material. And then the last one I want to introduce you to is this one on the far right. It's called a ratcheted pruner. In a ratcheted pruner, the cutting mechanism is that of an anvil. But what's nice about a ratcheted pruner is if you have sore or weak hands, this uses a pumping action to close this blade so that you can just squeeze it gently to cut the material. So it helps if you do have weak weaker or sore hands, you can still continue to prune and cut, just get the right tool for your application. So one of the other things you do in the garden is dig, and dig comes into two categories. You're planting something or you're weeding something. So let's talk about both. So if you're planting, one of the devices you're most commonly going to use is a shovel. There are three different types of shovel. This is the round tip spade. It's used for digging holes. That's its purpose. And we've all got one. The next one that you want to, you may, be, may not be as familiar with is a trenching spade. And a trenching spade looks like this. And it's got this narrow blade here. And it's used for digging in narrow areas. So if you're digging a, a trench for irrigation or you need to dig around a plant or in between plants, this is a nice one to use. Uh, what I also want you to notice about this is that this does not go straight like most shovels do. This has an angle to it. This angle is called a cant, C-A-N-T. And this becomes important if you're lifting heavy material. So if you're removing a plant or you're moving heavy soil, use a shovel that has a cant in it because it will do the lifting for you. You don't have to bend as far down as you would with a straight handled shovel as you do with this and then lift it up. You're letting the tool do the work for you. You're using leverage. So think about a trenching spade with a cant should you have to dig any sort of irrigation, narrow trenches, or lift a plant out of the soil. Bulb planters, it's bulb season, folks. So if you want those spring blooms, get your bulbs in within the next couple months. Um, this is bulb planter you can see has the inches on the side. It's a circular device. You put it in the ground you, to the distance you need to plant your bulb. You twist it, you pull it out, you put your bulb in, put the soil back on top, done. Okay, so it makes bulb planting really, really easy. Another device that makes planting easier is called a seed spacer. So this is a device, as you can see, it's a ruler and it has holes in it. So you use the this part here, I'm pointing to the screen, but this part here is called a dibble. And you put the dibble in for the depth you need for your seed, you drop the seed in, you cover it up, it's planted. What's nice about this one is it also tells you how far apart to plant your seeds. So if you're a seed planter like I am, this can be a really useful device um, when you're in the garden. And then lastly is the dibble. I mentioned the dibble earlier, but it is also used for determining how deep you need to plant the plant, specifically a bulb or any sort of the starts. But you don't need to go buy a device like this if you've got a pair of these at home. These are chopsticks. So you get your chopsticks, you break them apart, and then you write on here the distance. So quarter inch, half inch, an inch. And then when you plant your seeds, you just put it down to that gradation of a half an inch, pull it out, put your seed in, cover it, done. So you've got your own do-it-yourself dibble at home. That, that you can do very easily. So when you're in the garden, you wanna make sure you're, you're using some beneficial body mechanics. You wanna make sure that you're upright. This takes the pressure off your back. And how do you know if you're upright? So take your shoulder blades, recognize where they are, push them back and down. And that puts you into a nice neutral body positioning where your legs are carrying the weight and your back and shoulders and your neck are not. That's neutral positioning. When you're in the garden, you're also touching things. So there's called pressure points and pressure points are important to recognize because that's where blisters can form. So you're touching with your hands. So blisters can form across your palm and your of your hand. 
wear some gloves, make sure it's padded there so that you can take take care of your hands. Your feet is also are also pressure points. So again, the reason for comfortable closed-toed shoes. If you have sensitive feet that are prone to blisters, you may want to think about a second pair of socks. Plant your feet like our gardener here in the photo on the right. You can see that she's got a, a good wide spread. Her feet are on solid level ground. That'll help reduce the, the chance of your falling when you're in the garden, keeps you stable. And then always when you are using your garden tools, keep your elbow at shoulder height or below. That helps keep you stable. If you get too high with the, with the garden tools over your head, you can start to wobble. So if you need to go up higher, get a tool that telescopes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But when you're using your garden tools, keep your elbows below your shoulders. It's just safer for you. Weeding. Don't we love weeding? All gardeners love weeding. But there are tools that we can show, we're going to show you to help make this a little bit easier for you. And some of them are a little bit on the specialty side. So the one on the left is called a weed scythe. It is also called a patio knife or a hardscape weeder, but it's technically a weed scythe in the scythe family. So it looks like this, and it's this L shape. And on this side here is a bevel, and it's very thin as you see. And what this is used for is to clear weeds out in hardscape. So you've got a sidewalk that comes together, or you've got some hardscape that comes together. You put this, this weeder tool down below the weed, you rotate it, lift it up, the weed comes up, no chemicals. You don't need to use the chemicals to do this. You can have a, a weed scythe to help you out. The tool on the right is the hand weeder. I think you're probably pretty familiar with that. You stick the root or where the root starts to meet the, the leaves, that crown point of the weed in that V, lift it out and it works really well. But this one in the middle is one you may not be familiar with. It's called a four-pronged weeder. It's a st also called a stand-up weeder because that's exactly what you do. So let's take a look at that one. So you have your four prongs and you put the, uh, the prongs around the weed you want to remove and you see that there's this lever right here. So what you, you step on that lever, and you lean back a little bit. So the lever is hoping is helping to grab the root of the weed in these four prongs, and then you pull it out and you've got your weed. So if you have sore knees or sore backs or a lot of weeds that you need to do, a device like this can certainly make your gardening a whole lot easier. The multitaskers. Why take multiple tools out into the garden when one will suffice? These are tools that, that provide multiple do multiple tasks so that you can uh, have less tools out in the garden. The first one is the Hori Hori knife. The Hori Hori, uh, Hori stands for knife in Japanese. So this is a tool, this is a Japanese tool. And it looks like this. It's got the gradations on it, the unit, so you can use it as a bulb planter. It also is a very sharp point at the end, so you can use it to dig. It has these serrated edges along the time, so you can use it to cut some, some um, smaller roots, I'd say. And then it's got a smooth side over here, which you can use for leveling your soil. People who have these love these, the hori hori knife. The one in the middle is a hoe cultivator, because if you're um, planting seeds, like I was planting seeds over the weekend, um, you sometimes need to uh, use a hoe or the cultivator side to break up clods, but I use this to actually do the um, a line in the, in the soil where I could plant my seeds. I just drew a line with it, put the seeds in and covered it up. So a multitasker. And then the last one on the right is a trowel weeder. And it looks like this, okay. It has the prongs here at the top, so you can grab your weed. It is also a trowel. This is a narrow one. They come in different widths, so this is used for, for uh, planting bulbs mainly, but I do use it to dig when I need to dig. And it's got some serrated edges here, so you can use it on the, on the side to smooth soil, but this is also an ergonomic tool. So I want you to remember this. We're gonna come back to this a little later, but there are multiples of multitasker tools out there. So there's something for you to consider to simplify you know, your tool inventory. The hoe family. Did you know that there are 48 different types of hoes? 
I didn't know. I don't know what they are. We're not going to go through all 48. Don't worry. But we're going to talk about a couple different categories in the hoe family. One is called the paddle hoe, which are these ones that are solid. And then there's the scuffle hoe category, which are these ones that are open and they serve different purposes. So the paddle hoes are mainly used for uh, digging. So this is called a draw hoe because you draw it towards you when you are actually digging. You can use them for weeding also. They use are digging and weeding. And then this one is called an anvil hoe. Uh, again, you use it if you need to have a furrow. If you're planting up seeds in a long bed, you can use this to create a furrow. Oops, this one on the right is called an oscillating hoe because this part here is loose. So it adjusts to your you holding the pole in the soil, the terrain of the soil, so it goes with the soil. They have another one called a stirrup hoe, which is fixed. And I've, those are mainly, I see those used in hand tools, shorter tools, not in the long handle tools, but just know that there are two types that look like this. And then we have the hoes on the, this used for weeding. These tools in the, in the scuffle family are used mainly for weeding. These on the right, excuse me, on the left, these are called either Amish hose or, or push pull hose because they actually get rid of the weeds as you push the tool out and then draw it back to you. So you get action and work done both ways you move these hoes. These are not flat. It's a little deceiving to see in the photo. This is actually a distance of about between this pole and this part of the hoe is about an inch. So it's not level. So it goes under the soil about an inch to bring your weeds up. So the hoe family, these are some of the highlights of the hoe family. So you still at times do need to pick and prune up above you. Um, so there's a couple things to think about when you are doing that. So if you have fruit trees and you need to get up high to get the fruit off the trees, you may want to consider this product on the right, which is called a fruit basket. The fruit basket is uh, specifically what it says. You put the stem of the fruit in these prongs. You flick it with your wrist and it drops into that basket. And you can put this up. You can keep your elbows below your shoulders or at shoulder height. Put this above and let it do the work. These come in a variety of heights. They telescope. They can go up to 12 to 14 feet long with the telescope. The tool on the left is a pole pruner. There is also a saw version, a pruning saw version of this. Very similar concept to the fruit basket. Uh, let's, let's take a closer look at that. So there's the cutting mechanism. It's a bypass pruner. It goes around the um, material, plant material you want to cut, and you pull the rope and it and it cuts. So there the our gardener is standing on the ground. He's using this tool to cut up above him, still again being safe while doing this. But sometimes you can't, you can't, you have to get on a ladder, right? So there are three types of ladder. There's an extension ladder, there's a step ladder, and then there's this. This is a tripod ladder. And it's exactly what it says it is. It's a ladder that's got a safety pole at the back of it that gives you more stability. They come in heights from four feet all the way up to 20 feet. So you can get them in the size that works for you. What's nice about this one is that if you're on an uneven surface, it provides a little bit more stability. Um, especially if you're working on a slope, you can put the, the foot plates on level solid ground and then you can adjust the tripod for where you need to go. These are often used in the agriculture indus agricultural industry for harvesting crops. So um, this is one that the UC does recommend. But if you do need to get on a ladder, be safe. Make sure your ladder is operational before you get on it. Make sure that, you know, that the uh, the rungs haven't deteriorated, that they are attached well. Place your ladder on solid ground. Position your center along the center of the ladder. That helps you to remain stable. Obviously, don't use the top two rungs and avoid reaching too far to the left or to the right when you're on the ladder. Either get a tool to do the work you need to do or move the ladder, okay? So you do need to move things when you're in the garden. And here are some tools that will help you in moving. 
So the first one we're going to talk about are the rakes. On the left is the bow rake. On the right is the fan rake. The bow rake is used a lot for leveling soil and getting rid of clumps, bringing them all together. The fan rake is used for picking up detritus, leaves, um, any sort of debris that might be in your garden. The, both of these do come in a uh, long handle and a short handle form. I use the short handle form myself to get underneath trees that I need to pick up the fallen leaves. So it, I do find that useful. There, and whatever you do, for all of these tools, lay the tines down. That goes for hose, it goes for shovels, it goes for rakes, any of these tools. Because what was one of the things that caused people to be injured? Right, getting hit by something. And this is one of those somethings, especially one you can avoid. Lay the tines down. Because if you've ever been hit in the forehead by a tool that you've stepped on, like the Roadrunner cartoons, it's not funny. It hurts. So be cave. Be careful. Be conscious of where you put your tools. So forks. Forks are not really something that we think about a lot, but there are two different types of forks. There's a pitch fork and a spading fork. The pitch fork is got has rounded tines and they're lighter and they're used for lifting lighter material like mulch and hay. The other type of fork is a spading fork. Spading forks have thicker tines and they're rectangular and they're used for turning compost into the soil. So if you're turning compost on its own, use a pitchfork. But if you're using putting compost into a soil, use a spading fork because it will retain your soil structure, which in retaining your soil structure will help in re retaining or help in reducing compression so that your soil remains viable. Wheelbarrows. Now there's the standard wheelbarrow you're familiar with, the wheel in the front and the two handles in the back. If you need maneuverability, that's the way to go. They're a little heavier and they tip. Sometimes you want them to tip. But if you need to go into a narrow path or you need to move left and right a lot, that's a great tool. But if you don't, you may want to look for a tool that's got the wheels in the front. It's more stable. Um, for moving your product around. And this one's made out of a, a, a fiberglass material, so it's a little bit lighter. So there are options for you out there for moving product um, on wheels. And this, these are a couple of them. This is our third shovel. This is the square point shovel. The sh shovel is used for moving gravel or moving any sort of sand or anything that's on a a hard surface you want to get rid of. So square point shovel. And then something you probably already have in your, your garage right now is a tarp. Tarps work great for moving product. You put your, your detritus, your debris, or whatever it is you want to move on top of the tarp. We use ours for moving um, mulch throughout the yard. Put it on top of that. And then this one specifically has two handles on it. You can fold it over and then pull it, but you don't need that. You can just use your regular tarp, pull, pull it over, and pull it to wherever it is you need to go. When you're in the garden, moving safely is also uh, important because there is a risk that you could get injured while you're moving. So vary your motions in the garden. If you're doing something repetitively, that can cause muscle strain. Um, the muscles will get tired and they'll spasm. So if you have 20 roses to prune, break them into smaller sections. Do a few, then go do something else. Or do a few one day, come back the next day and do a few more. So vary your, your task. Uh, lift with your legs. Again, we had talked about that. Your legs muscles are big muscles. They're designed to do work, not these little arm muscles. So if you need to lift something, put yourself into um, a stance where your shoulders and your feet are lined up, you know, bend with your knees, pick it up and then tighten your core and then lift. Okay. Use your big muscles to do the lifting, not your arms, not your back. And this is one that's last one I know that I'm guilty of, but when you move, you're working on something and you're focused on it and something catches your eyes like, Oh, I need to go do that. And then you twist and you're, you don't move your feet and you're putting strain on your back, which that it's not used to having, and it could cause, again, muscle spasms and some muscle pain. You don't want that. So pick up your feet and, and put it in front of where you 
want to work. You want to also have this plane of your body parallel to the plane of the plant so that you face it. So move safely in the garden. So this is one of the natural breaks in the um, presentation. I'm going to check in with you all and see if there are any questions that have come up. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. Know that there's a couple other breaks that where we can ask questions. So we're going to talk about adaptive garden tools. So what does adaptive mean? So in the context of garden tools, it means tools that are designed and modified to enable you with if those of us with different abilities, either temporary or permanent, to garden safely and comfortably. So if you're having hand pain or back pain or weakness, you don't have to give up your love of gardening. There are tools that can help you. So let's go through a few of them. There are basically three different types of, of categories. One is rethinking what you have in the house already. The second is ergonomic. And then the last are specialty tools. So you may already have tools in your garden, in your household that can help you. So longer handles help to improve the reach for gardeners with limited mobility. This tool specifically telescopes. So if you need to reach something and you're sitting, you know, you, you don't want to get up and down a lot. Say you've got one of those little benches that you sit on. Get a tool that telescopes and help that with your raking instead of reaching forward and bending and bringing whatever it is you're raking back to you. Most tools have a telescoping capability, um, even pruners. They so there's a pruner manufacturer right now where with the handles, he make they, they're made with a hinge down at the bottom and then an extension that connects up here. So if you need to go further, you just drop down the handles and you have a longer pruner. And so that's something to think about. So in all types of garden tools, there are telescoping features. D-loop handles, which will help your hands. They're easier to hold than the actual pole, the, the long handle. So that's something to think about. There are even D-loop handles here in um, pruners. They, they're easier to hold, like I said, but they're also easier to hold onto because if you drop them, like this, your fingers are already through them and you won't have to go down, pick them up off the ground. So think about a D-loop handle. Reusing household items you may already have. So a lot of us have these type of grabbers and these are great if you need to pick up something on the ground. If your plumeria leaves are falling, you can grab them with something like this and you don't have to bend, you just pick them up, put them in your bucket and off you go. So these are really a great help in the garden too. And then lastly, there are some tools or devices out there that are used for other purposes that you might be able to use in the garden. And one is this garden trolley. So um, if you need to move something, you know, and the wheelbarrow doesn't work for you or the um, one with the two wheels in the front don't work for you, a garden trolley might. It's four wheels, so it's really stable. It's lighter because it's made out of cloth. It also collapses, to, so it makes it a little easier to move. And the handle can vary to your height. So it disconnects here so you can pull it away from the trolley, but then you can vary the height for your height so it could be much more comfortable. Something to think about. So ergonomic hand tools. So ergonomics is uh, the science of developing devices and tools to take work out of, to make work easier, more efficient and less um, tiring on the body. And that applies to garden tools also. So we talked a little bit about um, this device, which is the ratcheted pruner. The ratcheted pruner is a, an ergonomic tool for a couple reasons, because you do squeeze it to close your cut. But this one specifically has the D loop on it that we talked about, and this handle is padded. So that makes you know it a little bit more comfortable. If you like a regular bypass pruner, this is the one too that is also ergonomic. This angle here ensures that when you squeeze, you're using the bigger muscles to squeeze rather than your wrist muscles or your smaller muscles here in your forearm. One other thing that's nice about this one is this handle rotates. So when you squeeze, it's rotating with your fingers and not against your fingers. So if you have sore hands, it just nicely glides along. So there are ergonomic pruners out there for you to think about. 
We talked about my friend, the, um, the uh, multitasker here, the trowel weeder. This again, when you use this, this, this part is parallel to the ground. And when you lift the weed out, you're actually using this big muscle. So your wrist stays stable, your hand stays stable, very little work out of your forearm. And so you're using the bigger muscle in your arm so that these don't get as tired and you don't have to deal with the pain there. And um, what's also nice about this one is there aren't any sharp edges. It is blunt. So if someone is a bit unstable or if you're gardening with a child, you do want to make sure that they have tools with blunted edge to, edges to ensure that they stay safe. And then this is a specialty tool. This is an interesting tool. So again, if there is weakness or pain in your hands, there's a cuff. As you can see in this diagram on the bottom, the cuff goes around the arm and then you hold this handle right here. And then you're, again, you're using your big muscles to dig in the soil and it's keeping your arms stable. Again, so you're getting some strength from your big muscles and it's keeping this arm stable for any sort of weaknesses. And um, what's nice, what's interesting about this one is that the tool at the end is replaceable. This comes with four different types of tools. It comes with this, it comes with a cultivator, it comes with a hoe and it comes with something something else. I don't remember what it is. But if you're interested in something like this, just type um, specialty garden tools into your favorite browser, and there'll be a bunch of them that come up. So there are solutions for people out there who need a little extra help from their tools in the garden. Okay. So now you know what tools you are out there to do these variety of tasks, and you're ready to go buy some. What do you need to look for when you buy a tool? Let's let's dive into that. So one of the things is cost of ownership. How much is the tool going to cost you over the lifetime? And that's a decision purely up to you. You know, look at your budget. Decide how often you're going to use the tool. If you only use the tool occasionally, you may not need to invest as much. But if you use the tool a lot, you may want to invest a little bit more because it'll last longer. Because for garden tools, price is an indicator of quality. So if you want to buy a new pruner and you have a choice between um, a $10 pruner that'll last three years or a $60 pruner that'll last you 30, 40 years, you know, if you do the math, you got to replace that $10 pruner every three years because it just stops working. So over the course of 30 years, it's going to cost more to, it's going to cost you $100 to replace that that uh, $10 pruner versus a $60 pruner, which would have cost you $60. So it's maybe $10 for replacing the blade um, over 30 years. So you would have spent 70 versus 100. So knowing what you need to do in the garden will help you understand what is the right price range for tools that you should be looking at. There's a difference in materials for tools. Uh, the two major metals are forged steel and stamped steel. Forged steel has heat and pressure applied to it. Sometimes they add carbon to it. It's a much stronger steel. It holds the edge better. It's heavier and it's more expensive. And how do you know when you're buying a tool that it's, it's forged? It has to say it's forged. So it will say that it's forged it's tempered, it's heat treated. If it doesn't, it is not a forged steel product. It's probably the other one, which is stamped steel. So stamped steel envision um, a roll of steel rolled out and then cookie cutters that cut across it to, break, to cut out the metal. That's what stamped steel is. And it's not as strong, it's lighter weight, um, more frequent replacement. Uh, but more cost effective. So again, if you don't need to use something that often, you may want to think about stamp steel. So this is the bulb bulb trowel that I showed you about. This was the predecessor I had to, before I bought this one. This is supposed to go like this and be in a straight line, but my clay soil when I was using this caused this to bend. And this is a stamp steel product. So, you know, I didn't pay much for it, but, you know, I decided for my next one, I was gonna get one that was forged steel. And it does make a good demonstration. 
So handles are something else to consider. There are two different types of handles. There's fiberglass and there's wood. Fiberglass is lighter. It um, is easier to maintain. It's easier to clean and is a little more expensive. So wood is heavier. You have to maintain it by sanding it and moisturizing it, which we'll talk about in the maintenance section. The one thing to consider is if it breaks, if wood breaks, you can replace the wood handle. If the fiberglass breaks, you can't replace it with a fiberglass handle. So there's a trade-off, again, deciding what it is you need in your garden, wood handle or fiberglass handle. You need something lighter, you may want to think about fiberglass. Uh, they, I don't know if the, how often they break. I don't have an instance where they have broken, but they do break once in a while. So something for you to consider and think about. How they built is also important. You'll notice that this one, this shovel has an opening in the back that makes it... Um, conducive for moisture and grit to get in there, which can damage the wood, which can cause a short life for the handle. A more expensive version and a heavier version is one with a closed back. It will preserve the wood better, but it is more expensive and it is heavier. There are two different types of connections. This is a tang and ferrule. The top one up here is a post and the tang and ferrule is not as strong as the post. So again, when you're shopping, just know what you're buying and it might be fine to get this. I've got a bunch of tang and ferrule tools also like this one but this one's got a little larger parole on it which makes it a little bit more stable and will last a little bit longer so when you're buying a tool what fits within your budget and again price is usually an indicator quality think about the materials you need do you need something lighter can you live with something heavier does a tool have the right features so you know do you want an ergonomic tool do you want to um have a multitasker. So think about the features you want. Is the tool repairable? Can you replace the handle? Can you replace the blade? Are the, are the parts available to do that? What are the maintenance differences between the tool? And then most importantly, how does it feel in your hand? Because if it doesn't feel good in your hand, you aren't going to use it. You're going to set it aside and you're going to use something else. And then you've just wasted your investment. So try them out beforehand and make sure that the height of the handles is right for you. Make sure the weight is right for you. And especially on pruners, this grip distance, let me use these, this grip distance here varies. So you want to make sure that it's not too wide and that you're stretching too far to, to, to use your pruners. Okay. So our next section is maintenance, how you take care of your tools. Does anybody have any questions before we move into maintenance? Okay, I'm gonna take that as a no. All right, so you've bought your tools and uh, you've learned about your tools. Now we're gonna take care of that investment so they last your lifetime and maybe even longer. So why do you wanna maintain your tools? Well, for the longevity. You, like I said, you invested in them, you want them to last. You want to have clean cuts, especially on your cutting tools because clean cuts are safer for you because you don't have to squish as hard and it's safer for the plant because then you don't bend the stem and you don't get those stringy things that sometimes can happen. That's usually due to an issue with your pruner. Uh, safer for you and they're easier to use if you have a maintained tool. It's easier to cut, even shovels. If you were to just sharpen your shovels once a year, you'll find they're easier to when you do to start to dig. So there is a process and it's the process for remembering is scrub, sharpen, sanitize, the three S's. And we're gonna step you through what needs to be done for that. So I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. There's more information on our website. Uh, there's a written uh, definition and, and there should be some handouts that's, that came that have go into more detail. There's also a video and I'm gonna show you hopefully if it works, a video clip of how to sharpen your tools. But more information is on our website. So you need to gather some supplies and the supplies depend on what you are doing. So to remove rust, you need a wire brush, something like this, little soft, Bristles on it work really well. You need a foaming bathroom cleaner to clean your tools. You need steel wool or a sanding block. This is a sanding block. These things are really great. It's a piece of foam that's got sandpaper inside of it. So for removing rust or any sort of grime from your tools, these are, these are great. 
For removing rust, also white vinegar. You'll need a sharpening device if you're going to sharpen your tools, and we'll step you through that. For taking care of your wood handles, boiled linseed oil, and then for taking care of all of your tools, a lubricating oil. Okay. So the first thing you want to do is take a look at your tools and figure out what is it that I need to do with them. Are they rusty? Are they dirty? So again, with your pruners, you want to inspect them. You want to look on the blade to see if there are any divots. And it's gonna be hard to see here, but there are divots in this particular blade right here. I put them there because I did the wrong thing. But the divots are losses of metal and it's they are formed because you cut something too big um, with the pruners and they had to torque and the metal broke. Or you, sit, you sharpened them too thin and the metal broke. So you wanna look for that. You also wanna see if they're aligned. You see if there's any gaps in between here, it could be as simple as you need to tighten the nut and bolt on your pruners, or it could be that in the course of using the pruners, the blade has bent. And if the blade is bent, you're done. You, 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 we can't fix that. So that's why you inspect. So you look to see what the condition is of your printers. You want to start by removing the debris and the dirt because you have to be able to see what your the condition is of your blade. So you hold them safely so the blade's away from you. Just brush them down. If you if the that doesn't work and the sanding um, sponge doesn't work, get a foaming bathroom cleaner, spray it on your blade, let it sit for two to three minutes, both sides, and then come back and repeat the process until, it's, until it starts to clean up. Now, rust is a problem with garden tools. Um, rust is a Re chemical reaction between water and iron that causes uh, iron oxide. I think it's oxide, not oxate. But essentially what rust is, is taking metal off your tools. Your tools are getting damaged with rust. So the best thing you can do for rust is not have it happen. And that's like keeping your tools in a safe, dry area. Um, but if you you have a tools that are rusty, a couple things you can do. Use the wire brush, the sanding block, or the steel wool to get the rust off. If that doesn't work, you may need to soak them in a chemical. So you move from a mechanical method into a chemical method. The best one is to soak it in vinegar, plain white vinegar, not cleaning vinegar because cleaning vinegar contains water. And as we just learned, water causes rust. So clean uh, excuse me, pure white vinegar. Soak it in there for a period of time. It might need 20 minutes. It might need days. So this is a trowel that I have that I soaked in vinegar for two days and the rust does come off. So if you have rust, your tool is salvageable. Better than that, it's even usable. Again, we'll teach you how to do that. So get the rust off of your tools to start with. So then you're ready to, that's our scrub portion. Now you're ready to sharpen. And so you got to gather some things to sharpen. You need to have a sharpening device. And there's a variety of them out there. Pick one that works best for you. So let me just show you a couple of them. So this is a carbide sharpener. They're very common. They're available in all garden centers. The carbide is harder than steel. So you need to have a device like carbide or diamond, diamond that will sharpen the, the tool. You are actually taking a little bit of metal off when you are doing this. So carbide tool, these are great for beginning sharpeners because it's very simple. The other two devices you can have, these are diamond hones. There's actually diamond as part of the surface. And these are also diamond hones too. They come in a variety of, of coarseness. Um, for me, with my, my hands, these work better for me because they're smaller but they don't last as long. So these wear out quicker than these. So something you should know, but find yourself a sharpening device that you are comfortable with. Um, if they're a highly damaged uh, pair of pruners, like the, oops, didn't wanna show you that yet. Like this one with the divots, or if it's the pruning saw with the serrated blade, you'll need a professional service. But frankly, the blades on these are inexpensive to replace. So you may wanna think about just replacing that. Um, so if you have highly damaged tools, those 
you'll need to go to a professional service. And whatever you do, again, please do not touch the blade. It's sharp. Okay, so the method is you're looking for what's called a bevel. And the bevel, this is the blade and this is the hook. And the bevel is this angle piece that goes along the blade here. You should be, it's one of the reasons why you clean your tools so you can see the bevel and see the condition of the bevel. You wanna hold a tool in a way that's safe for you, that's, that keeps the blade away from you. One of the things that happens with beginning sharpeners is they'll, they'll be sharpening, I don't know how to do, they'll be sharpening and they'll put their knuckle right into the blade. They just rotate and go, ooh, right like that. Don't do that. You, your method is to go along this from pivot point here to point. So from pivot to point, you're gonna sharpen along that, that way. You do two to three passes, because again, you're taking metal off. And then you turn the blade over, because in the sharpening process, you bent metal to the back of the blade. Take your sharpening device and just do one pass along the back to take those burrs off the back. Remove the grit. And then if you need to go finer, you know, if it's not sharp enough yet, then go with a finer uh, sharpening device with one of those diamond sharpeners. Okay, I'm going to show you a video that's a little easier to see than my demonstration. I want you to notice when you're watching the video that this is the blade, this is the blade here, and that this is the bevel, the shiny part right here. I want you to notice how Alan is holding the, the pruners while he is doing this, um, and then watch for the, how he moves the sharpener along the bevel to sharpen it. He has a really great technique. I'll show you how to use this carbide sharpener. Carbide is actually better than this steel tool. And it's used evenly and that it scrapes the steel instead of rubbing it off. And again, I match the angle and rub this along the entire edge of the blade two or three times. Now we're done with the hand burners. Okay. So you notice he kept his knuckles behind the sharpener and then he sharpened from the pivot point, pivot to the point and one, one smooth motion. Don't stop in between because if you do, you're leaving a divot in the blade. So just one smooth motion. I want to thank Alan Guchinski. He is a master gardener out of the Santa Clara County Master Gardeners. He created this video. This entire video of how to sharpen and clean your tools is available on our website. So if you're interested in learning more, that video is really worth watching. How to use this Oops. Sharpener. So how do you test for sharpness? So, so we're done. You took, first do a visual test. Does it look sharp? Does it look like your divots got out of here? You can see there's a little divot here and she was able to get the divot out here and see the difference between these two, getting the rust off of here and onto this one here on the right. It's amazing. And then you wanna test it. So you wanna cut a piece of material. So by material, I don't mean fabric, I mean another item. So you can try a thin branch, a thin dry branch to cut it or some live plant material. And then you test it he, at the various points on this blade, you want to test it here in the middle and at the point to make sure you've done an even sharpening along the way. Um, the really good people, and there's some people on our committee that are like this, can cut paper. They get that so good. It's always there's always a new challenge, but that that's an option. But one thing I want to make you aware of a couple things is again, don't touch the blade. It's really sharp. And some of the internet sharpeners will they have to show you how to sharpen on the internet will say, just touch the blade with your finger. No, it's sharp. They do this as a living. They're professionals. We're not. And so you're at risk of, get, of hurting yourself. You just slice, you could just slice your finger with it. So use another device, use, it, use something else as a target to cut. Don't put your finger on the blade. And then one of the things you want to do is sanitize. Sanitization is important in garden tools because you can transfer disease from one plant to another plant. So if one of your roses, for example, is infected with the disease and you're pruning, then you go to the next rose and cut it. You've just transferred the disease from that rose to your other rose. Palms are also another issue where there's a lot of diseases with palms and you always want to make sure that if you're having them professionally trimmed, that the, the supplier has 
clean their tools before they cut, if they have someone come in to do any sort of pruning in your property. So you sanitize with an alcohol wipe. And it can be the ones in the jug like you see there, the big bottle, or you can get these medical wipes, which are really nice because you can keep them in your pocket or your apron when you're out in your garden. So you you um, wipe it down. When you're done with your, your sharpening, you just wipe it down, make sure it's sanitized. And when you're in the garden, pruning, just wipe it down between plants. Don't use bleach. Bleach is corrosive to the metal. It starts to take some of it away also, and as it can damage you and your skin. We don't want that. Then the last step is to protect with a lubricating oil. Why do you want to do this? Lubricating oils help in reducing rust. So as the very last step in the maintenance process, put oil, a drop of oil on your tool. Put it at the junction point, this pivot point, put it on the blade, a little bit of rag, wipe it in, massage it in. If it's still kind of creaky and if it's still um, hook hit, you know, has hooks a little bit, you know, how it kind of hangs up, put another drop in there and just keep working it in so that you get a nice smooth motion in your tools and you're also protecting your blade. So what is a lubricating oil? There's two types, there's penetrating and there's lubricating. Lubricating oils are oils such as motor oil, sewing machine oil, three-in-one oil, mineral oil. WD-40 is a penetrating oil. It's a different category of oil. Penetrating oils tend to collect grime and dirt. So if you use WD-40 on your tools, you have just created a dirt magnet and you will have to clean that all the time. And you could get gunk in your joint and you'd have to tear your pruners apart to clean that out. So use a lubricating oil, mineral oil, motor oil, sewing machine oil, three-in-one oil. Wood handle protection. Um, if you have wood handles, make sure sand them down. Use your sandpaper, use your steel wool, use your sanding block. Make sure it doesn't have any splinters or nicks. Look for cracks. Cracks are a sign that it's going to break and you may want to uh, repair that tool. If when you a good practice to get into when you have a wood handle is to start at the beginning to moisture the wood with boiled linseed oil. Now it's not boiled anymore. It used to be boiled as chemically treated, but there's a difference between linseed oil and boiled linseed oil, and it's the drying time. If you use linseed oil, it'll take two to three weeks to dry. If you use boiled linseed oil, you're talking two to three days. Okay, so you put it on a rag and you wipe it onto your tool. I have an example, this is my favorite, you know, trench, trenching spade. And you see it just leaves a little bit darker color to it. And that's the moisture that's going in here. And the moisture keeps it from drying out, keeps it from cracking, and it makes for uh, a tool that will last longer. However, there's a caution if you use boiled linseed oil. The rags are highly combustible. So if you use it, lie the rags out, not touching one another let them dry completely and throw them in the trash. If they put them into a pile, they will combust and the fire department will come to your house if you're not able to stop it out yourself. So be very careful if you use boiled linseed oil. Storing your tools, again, another way to prevent rust, store them in, make sure they they're they're have the lubricating oil in them, make sure your storage location is dry, so a storage shed in the garage out of the moisture that we have here um, in San Diego. You can put your tools into a bucket of sand moistened with motor oil. That works. It's not really necessary here in San Diego. That's more of a back east down south type of thing where they have higher humidities. But you can do it here to store your tools without damage, with the exception of any of your cutting tools, because you do not want sand to get into this joint or you'll be cleaning it again. So in summary, select the right tool for you to use. Maintain your tools for longevity. Label and remember where you put your tools. Use your tools for what they're designed to do. Don't use your pruners to cut wires. I know it's tempting, but there is a pruner out there that has a notch in the blade for cutting wires. So if you do need that, or you know that you are going to do that, get yourself a pruner with the notch to cut wires and don't use the blade. And then most of all, happy gardening gardeners.